welcome to the DIFF, the online festival of ideas, where we ask the question, what if we could redesign everything? Today, 60% of the world population lives in cities, and we are going to talk in this session about new ways of imagining cities so that they can be vibrant, healthy ecosystems. My name is Camille, I work at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and I have the pleasure today to introduce you to Ken Yang, uh, eco-architect, architect but ecologist first, who calls us from Malaysia today. Hello Ken and thank you for joining us. Uh, hello everybody. Uh, um, so Ken, just, just to start the conversation, you, you're calling from Malaysia, is that right? Yes. Where, where about are you at the moment and what time is it? Uh, I'm in Kuala Lumpur now and I think it's about five something in the afternoon. All right. Um, so thank you for joining us. And I would say to, to start with, what, um, what, what, how did you start your journey as an eco-architect? Because it has been about 40 years that you are working in, in this field. So what started you, what sparkled you to start on this journey? Well, about 40 years ago, uh, I was part of the technical research unit at the Department of Architecture at the University of Cambridge to work on the Autonomous House Project. The Autonomous House Project is a project mooted by the American engineer, about Mr. Fuller, to produce a house, to design a house that is independent of the infrastructural and utility, utilities of the, of the city, so that's why it's called Autonomous House. But after six months into this project, I concluded that the project is more about engineering and that the real issue is about ecological design. So I left the unit and got the approval of the Department of Architecture to become a research student to write a doctorate on ecological architecture and planning. And so that's how I got started. And that was uh, at the Cambridge University in the UK, is that right? That's right, yes. So I, tell I, I, fin I finished in 1975 and I came back to Malaysia to start practice. And that's what I've been doing, doing ecological architecture since uh, since that, since the uh, mid seventies. So let's um, let's tell us about what you call ecological architecture. What what is it about? What is your vision for this? Well, um, what we have been doing as human beings is to is to build without consideration to nature. And what I found is that most of the architects who design green buildings are very engineering driven or driven by accreditation systems. But most of them have little or insignificant consideration of the ecology of the planet. Now, ecology is not just, you know, um, vegetation. It has to do with looking at the planet in terms of, in a holistic way, about um, biodiversity, about hydrology, about um, how, how nature recycles its materials, um, and a whole series of things that nature does, um, which we have, you know, which is invisible to the human eye, which is crucial to, the, uh, to all life on the planet. So to me, ecological architecture is architecture that takes into consideration the ecology of the planet in the design in every aspect of the, of the architecture, from the time the materials are extracted from the planet, uh, through its process of assembly, through its process of fabrication, to construction, to its operation, and to what happens to material at the end of their useful life. And so, you know, it's, 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 it's not an easy uh, process to design, but that's what a truly ecological architecture should be about. So you're, you're telling me that it should be about weaving, in, in a way, cities with the, the ecology around it, rather than being isolated in organic structures on top of the environment. Well, my contention is that cities are not ecosystems. 
they are, if you like, pseudo ecosystems or semi ecosystems, mm -hmm. because um, there are fundamental differences between a city and an ecosystem. The biological structure of the city is different from the biological structure of ecosystems. The ecosystem has both biotic constituents and abiotic constituents acting together to form a whole system. Whereas the city is disparate with regards to its biotic constituents, it has sure it has parks, it has green areas, it has green patches, it has green squares, it had hedges and roadside bridges. Some of these, some of these areas are some of these are very has very high level of biodiversity, but they the biotic constituents don't interact with bios abiotic constituents to make a whole system. And therefore, I, I, you know, I don't think of cities are ecosystems. What we need to do is to make our cities into what are called constructed ecosystems, uh, ecosystems which are surrogate ecosystems, which are able to have a complement of biological uh, inorganic organic constituents to match the uh, inorganic constituents of the, of the huge inert mass of buildings to function as an ecosystem. So as the surrogate ecosystem, cities should be able to provide what are called ecosystem services um, that will make the city not dependent on its hinterland or surrounding rural areas to provide the services uh, to serve the city. So could you tell us what's a, what would be typically an ecosystem service? Well, ecosystem services like uh, sequestering uh, pollutants in the air, mm -hmm. production of oxygen, as plants do for, for, through photosynthesis, through uh, purification of water, um, and reduce, you know, reduction contamination of the land, a host, host of factors that nature does for us for free. Nature does this for us without any human intervention. And if we continue to devastate ecosystems, um, existing ecosystems, then it will eventually lead to collapse of ecosystems or reduce the capability of the planet to sustain itself. And so the first priority that a city must do uh, as a constructed ecosystem is to be able to replicate and emulate ecosystems' ability to produce, eco to produce ecosystem services. Um, Ken, I believe part of your work has uh, some some uh, buildings that you've already built that are already out there, either in Malaysia or in other other countries. But you also do uh, master plans to to enable imagining what those um, constructed constructed ecosystems would look like. Would you mind sharing with us some of these master plans? For example, you met you mentioned Ecotopia. Yeah, one of the main things we do is to enhance the biodiversity of every project we design in every location. And so we prepare what you can see here, a biodiversity matrix, where we design the buildings at the site as a series of habitats, whether they're on the ground or in the building, on the facade of the building. Then we do research on the native fauna which are not hazardous human beings that we bring back into the site. I'll, so you can see can that just, site. Sorry, I'll just pause you there. Would you mind sharing with us the, the matrix so that the viewers could have a look at it? Yeah, I think the matrix is now, uh, here you are, here's yes. the matrix. Yes, perfect. So, so the matrix on the left hand side are the uh, fauna that we want to bring back into the site, uh, native fauna, which, we, which are not hazardous to human beings. And then on the top bar, you can see the different habitats that we create on the building and on the ground. And then we try and select the fauna that will attract the, the flora that will attract the fauna. And then we match the two together, the habitats with the fauna and the flora. And you can see how the matrix shows where they match so that uh, you'll bring back the fauna, whether for feeding, breeding, or refuge um, to enhance the biodiversity of the development. So in this way, our buildings and our site becomes a total living system and not just an inert piece of structure or machinery. And so this is the first thing that we do to enhance the biodiversity of the, uh, of the, of the, of, of, of the, of the buildings that we design. 
So uh, then we try to put vegetation in our buildings, and this is uh, one of the buildings we designed. You can see that uh, you know the buildings, um, the vegetation has to be continuous in an ecological nexus because by continuous enables species migration, enables species interaction within the ecosystem, and then generates a, a larger pool of resources for the species to share. And this en enables a, a, a greater level of biodiversity, uh, which makes it a much more stable system without the problem human being. This is a building that we completed in Singapore, but this is a concept drawing. This is not the actual building itself, but we've completed this building you know, about 10 years ago. Um, it's in Singapore, and here we have we had a continuous uh, vegetation strips that starts from the ground, use, weaves its way up to the building to the mid level, and then further up to the uppermost uh, top of the building. Um, you asked me to show an idea of what our ideal future would be. So this is one of the images we did. Um, it's an incomplete drawing. We're still working on it. Uh, what the future, what I call ecotopia, could be which is you know, a future where buildings are fully bi-integrated with the natural environment. Where, where would that be located, Ken? If you go back to that picture, that, that's the ecotopia, right? The, the one you just showed. Around the world. So this is one of the buildings we did in London in the Guildford Street. It's the Great Ormond Street Children's, uh, Great Ormond, Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital Extension. Uh, we could not put a, too much vegetation facade, but it has a vegetative roof, a seeded roof. But that diagonal strip you see there is a flue that makes the building low energy. It sucks up the air during the mid-season, so spring and autumn, so that the first three floors uh, do not require any heating or cooling, so that this reduces energy consumption of the building. By now, how much, approximately? Uh, it's about, well, I haven't got exact figures, but we try to achieve about 10 to 20 percent of the uh, existing energy consumption and then we try to reduce it by other means by looking into uh, ground source heat pumps and other devices. Now to, in order to provide ecosystem services, this is a master plan that we did for a site in um, east of Madagascar uh, in an island called Red Union, where here we brought the vegetation as a series of strips in between the urban areas so that the vegetation is able to provide ecosystem, ecosystem services to the urban areas. This is in contrast to what most existing cities have, where all the vegetation is either located in one central location, as in Hyde Park or Regents Park, or in Central Park in New York, or in, you know, but, and it's right cheek by jowl with all the urban areas so that they can produce urban, you know, uh, provide ecosystem service to the urban areas. So this is an example of how we could do this, regardless of where we are, regardless of whether we are in, uh, you know, in London or in Brazil or in Kazakhstan. The whole idea is to, we need to interweave uh, the vegetative areas with the green areas. That sounds great. Could we go back to one of these images, to the, the one you were just on? Um, Which one? No, the last one. Oh yeah, this one as well. I I just want to know where where can I find that? Can I find this soon? Is it is it a plan for for Malaysia? Is it a plan for uh, where, which country did you imagine putting this in? Oh, well, this is a vision, our vision for for Ecotopia. Mm -hmm. So it could be anywhere in the world. And. Is that a very long-term project, or is there some funding for it already? Oh, no, 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 no. This is just a, a concept image mm. to guide us in the way we design. It is not the natural project. Ah, I look forward to seeing it real, though. Okay. Well, we're still working on this drawing. It's not fully completed yet. Great. Um, uh, with regard to the one you showed uh, the, at last, it looked like a green carpet. So th this this completely green image, this is actually buildings down there. This one? Yes. Okay. Yeah, you can see the vegetative strips going in between the urban areas. The urban areas are, are, are highly vegetated. 
the imagery that vegetated the strips. Uh, this is the part that for this in Reunion Island, there is a, a natural vegetation strip along the waterfront. We're trying to link it, you know, uh, in between the built up areas, going underneath the highway, right up to, to the hills, because this is a natural drainage channel, a drainage flow from the hills. And so in this way, um, we're able to have what I call the ecological nexus that links all the vegetation together uh, to enable species interaction and migration uh, within the island. Just to clarify, what do you mean by an ecological nexus? Nexus means connectivity. If it's not connected, then what you have is disparate patches. And once you have disparate patches which are not linked, it, it, it inhibits a species movement, species migration, and species interaction. So uh, in ecosystems, ecological nexus is very important. So you mentioned uh, an ecosystem would uh, have the function of cleaning the air, it would also attract uh, species and, and develop a certain habitat. What sorts of species do you already see in some of the buildings that you've uh, built so well, far? Well, you have to do research on the appropriate species because you don't want to bring alien species to a location because sometimes the alien species could be invasive. And by invasive, it could totally destroy the eco ecology of that particular locality. And so we do research on the native species that we want to bring back to that locality of both flora and fauna. Uh, so ecotopia is, you said, something more like a vision and it's a master plan for the future. But uh, what do you think would be needed to make it real, to make it happen? Well, I think it all starts with, um, with people. Uh, the, the mindset of people must be such that they accept that it's necessary to, to design with nature rather than design or build against nature. And to change the people's mindset is a, is a function of education and um, facilitizing uh, our ideas, the idea of the uh, ecological future. Then having changed the mindset, we need to change the uh, society systems, the social systems, the economic systems, the, the commercial systems, and even the political systems to become, uh, to, 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 to see that it is necessary to design and build and to operate and to function and to live with nature. Now, this is a massive undertaking. It is beyond the uh, capability of, of, of myself as a designer or, as, or beyond the capability of community designers. And so uh, we, really, you know, we need the, the, the support of, of government and institutions and, and, and people to, to change the, uh, the institutional systems. Then once we change the institutional systems, then it's much easier to change the physical systems, which is our cities, our buildings, uh, our manufacturing systems, our production systems of energy and artifacts, uh, you know, so that these will be, uh, have a, what I call a benign and seamless relationship with the natural environment. Do you see this, the, the mindset changing? Do you see that that is... Um actually getting into action uh, across the, your, your career? Have you seen more and more people being involved with ecological architecture? Well, I think in the last uh, 20, 30 years, there have been significant movements in, uh, in ecological architecture, but I think not enough, because we need to change not just the uh, the way we think, but the, 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 as I said, our institutions and the way we create our physical built environment. So it's heading in the right direction, but personally, I don't think it's enough. Uh, we probably we only, I think we only got the thin end of the wedge. What about schools? What about architecture schools? Is that a topic that's taking more and more space in the curriculum? Well, I don't think they're teaching the right things, although some schools are heading in the right direction. 
Freud says most schools of architecture, when they teach materials, they teach about weathering, they teach about the decorative aspects of materials, they teach about how materials are fixed together, you know, um, and, and the life uh, and, and the, the lifespan of materials. But they should look at materials from source to sea, from how materials are extracted from the ground, what are the ecological impacts of, of extraction materials, what are the ecological impacts of transportation materials, what's the ecological impacts of the fabrication materials, what's the ecological uh, uh, implications of assembly materials, and what's the implications of disassembling materials and recycling and reusing them. And so, you know, the whole approach to materials, for example, the schools of architecture have to be totally rethought, but, not, but very few, if any, schools of architecture do that right now. Ken, I would love to hear more about the cost implication of your building. And actually, we have a question from Harry from the audience asking about that. But first, I would like to pause the conversation here. And now let's hear about uh, what's coming up next for this last day of the diff. And let's hear from my co-host, Sophie. Thank you. Hello, and thanks, Camille and Ken, for this lovely discussion. Uh, this is our last day, unfortunately, at the DIF. Uh, we still have a couple of things coming up today, so stay tuned and keep on um, tagging and twittering and tweeting, sorry. Um, the circular design fin case finale is coming up at 11 GMT, and then how innovation districts can transform cities with Cat Hanna, that's at 1 PM, also GMT. And then also, obviously, we have the DIF grand finale with everyone from the studio in the studio and the foundation, and that's starting at 1700 GMT. With that, back to Camille. Thank you, Sophie. And as I was saying, we are now going to hear about cost implication. So Ken, could you tell us what, uh, what are the cost implications of current buildings that you are uh, ecological bu buildings? Well, uh, Th does that mean that it's, uh, it, does it cost more to create green architecture? Does it cost less? Does it save money in the end? Well, the, uh, if you take rating systems as, uh, as a standard, we have designed platinum rated buildings 6.3% uh, over industry standard for that building type. And so we usually, when we design green, build, green buildings, we ask the client to budget between 5 to 25% of the budget of, 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 of the standard building cost for that particular building type. Now, for the Solaris building that we did in Singapore, which is this building, <clears throat> uh, uh, we, we, we built this, and uh, got this built at 6.3% above industry standard, and it has energy and water savings of about, uh, I, I have to recheck the figures, about 70 cents US per square foot, uh, which can be advertised over construction over five to eight years. Now, after the advertising period, the building continues to save energy and water. And so that is the, you know, the commercial advantage, commercial benefit of green buildings. But to me, there are other benefits of green buildings which are important and crucial to nature. And so uh, these are some of the figures that we, we, uh, we have. Uh, calculated for some of the buildings we designed. With, with regards to um, cost implications, so that, that's, uh, that works well for one building and it seems that it, it does uh, pay well in the end. When it comes to, to bigger cities, there, there aren't just uh, cost implications, there's also social implication. Um, and it means that uh, so the way cities are built now, are, they are very congested and we have to, to, to account for that when we want to redesign and rethink cities uh, in, in the way that they can become sort of green carpets and interweaved um, corridors of, of uh, plants. Now, 
does that mean if we want to build such cities, we would have to rebuild them from scratch? Or do you imagine we can transition from today's cities towards uh, cities uh, such as the Ecotopia city that you were showing us earlier? Well, I think, uh, well, if we believe in the future, we believe anything is possible, provided the political will and the money is available. But, you know, green architecture is only a very small, designing green buildings is a very small component of what we do because I believe that maybe within 10, 15 years' time, every architect will be designing green buildings, um, part of the pun. A second nature. Now, when every architect does equal green buildings as part of their process of designing, that will be great because they can focus on what architects should be really doing. I think the architect should be really doing, should be really doing, is to design places and spaces and buildings that make people happy, give pleasure to their lives. And if an architect is able to do this, then his his whole purpose of existence is fulfilled. And so to me, this is the social aspect of architecture, to design places and buildings and spaces that make people happy and have pleasurable lives. So for instance, if you design a home for somebody, and if that home gives immense pleasure to the family who live in it, it makes them, a, you know, gives them a happy uh, uh, family life, then you have fulfilled the, the uh, my, you know, your ambition as being an architect. And I think that's fundamentally important. And doing designing build, green buildings is one very small aspect. To me, a good building must do four things. First of all, it must be green, yes. It must fulfill uh, criteria, which is the you know, uh, local authority requirements, has to be well built, it's within budget, has to be, you know, uh, function well. And then it must uh, be immensely beautiful because that's what we are, we're artists. We, we, we want to make buildings as beautiful as possible. And finally, the most important aspect of designing, as I mentioned earlier on, is to make cities livable, to make places pleasurable, to make you know, people happy who use, who use those places. And, and that, these are the key, the key criteria for me in design. I totally agree with your vision and, and I really look forward to see such cities. Now, how would you, consider, considering that today's cities are more like concrete jungles rather than um, eco ecosystem, how would you imagine transitioning to that, to, to get to well, the vision that you described? Well, it'll be, it'll be a major effort in retrofitting and restoring and rejuvenating the cities become ecological systems. And so uh, I believe that the money is available if we don't waste it on, on, on armaments and, and going to war and doing all sorts of silly things. <laughs> and that um, if we focus on making our cities uh, into what I call ecotopias, then we are heading towards a sustainable future. As a first step, let's take an example, London, for example. What would you, um, what would you recommend the government to, to do to start with transitioning London into an uh, ecotopia-like city? Well, the first thing you need to do is to look at it as, you see, to me, ecological design starts with the biointegration of three eco-infrastructures. I call them eco-infrastructures because these are key factors we need to integrate together. The first one is the green eco-infrastructure. Second is the engineering infrastructure, the technical infrastructure. The third is the water infrastructure. And the fourth is human services, the human infrastructure. But the first and most important infrastructure we must introduce in cities is to, is to create a continuous series of green belts across the city. Now, this requires linking, for instance, uh, in the, all the green areas from, let's say, from the river down to uh, Regent's Park, to, to Hyde Park, all the way down to Richmond, if you can. But to, in order to, to, but there are existing roads, so you have to build over the roads. And so the devices that we use is what we call eco-bridges. 
and saw that the Great Ring can be continuously linked from the north to south and east to west of London. And so this is one of the first things we need to do. And the opportunities are doing that because, for instance, if you take the, uh, you know, the Bloomsbury area, you have a series of squares. You know, your Bedford Square, Temple South Square, Euston Square, your Russell Square. Is it possible to link the squares together? Not just uh, sometimes over the road, sometimes along the roadsides, and, and able to drink the squares, then Blue Screen become a totally linked ecosystem rather than a series of isolated patches. And so that's one of the things you need to study and to make it work, to create the eco green eco infrastructure within the city. Once we've done this, then we look into how this can integrate with the water infrastructure, which is to try and make sure the water that falls on the land stays in the land because what has happened now is the water goes to the land, goes to the roads, goes to the drains, what goes to the rains, goes to the river and to the sea and it's gone forever. And so we need to maintain a sustainable water, uh, what we call sustainable urban drainage. And then the water that falls on the buildings, we should try and recycle and reuse that and through a hydrological uh, um, balancing of the city. So I call this the green the the, the blue infrastructure, and we should integrate that with the green infrastructure. And then the next is to look at the technical in infrastructure of engineering. So the engineering systems must, should not use non-renewable sources of energy, because there's no point, a lot of architects think that because they do green buildings, you know, that's it. But if that green building is linked to a grid in which the source of energy comes from non-renewable sources, that is, you know, it, it beats the whole idea of designing, of, 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 uh, of ecological, of, of design to save the planet. Because, uh, you know, if the, the electricity that comes to the, to, or the energy that comes to the building, no matter how green it is, comes from non-renewable sources, that is not green. And so we have to start from the infrastructure uh, and we look where design cities where you should not just look at buildings, but look at starts with the infrastructure. So these are some of the things that we should do to make London to make London green. On top of that, we need to educate people to change their mindsets and to change the institutions to become green. Okay, so just to summarize that, you had uh, you said the first principle would be around building green corridors and, and linking the, the the green around the city. Second would be around the water system and make, making sure it stays and recirculates. Third would be around the technical infrastructure, the technical aspects and engineering aspects that would uh, have passive building and, and make the best of uh, uh, energy, uh, renewable energy. And fourth would be around educating people so that they can integrate all of this infrastructure and, and be part of this constructed ecosystem. Well, that's a quick summary. <laughs> it's a very quick, it's, it's my understanding as a non-expert, obviously. Okay. Um, yeah. Should we go back to some of the buildings that you showed earlier, just to have a bit more pictures of, of some of the buildings that, that are already existing today? For example, the Edit Tower or the, the Solaris building? Uh, uh, well, you know, the only image I have of, of a building that we completed is the uh, Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital in, in Guildford Street in the Bloomsbury area in London, um, and the Solaris in Singapore is completed, mm -hmm. uh, but the Edith House is not completed yet, it's not built yet. So this one, what do you call this one, sorry? This is the Edith Tower. Which is in what city? Oh, it's in Singapore. In Singapore, so we can, it actually yeah. exists today. Sorry? It actually exists already, it's not just a master plan. Ten years ago. Okay, great. That, uh, this is a proposal we did for Seoul in Korea, um, and uh, this is not built yet. This, sorry. Um, I had a question around maintenance so there's um you you add a lot of uh, organic matter to inorganic buildings and does that mean it's harder to maintain does that mean it's it's more work uh, to maintain the building D does it make the building more fragile 
or, or likely to, to have a structure that is more fragile? Well, do you know that that is the most frequently asked question mm -hmm. like that? Now, I call it the Gardener Index. Whenever I complete a building, I tell the client, this is a three garden building or four garden building, and the only cost to them in maintenance is the uh, cost of the fill, which isn't very expensive, and the replacement of the, of the, uh, of, of the planting. Uh, but it is the gardener's salaries that cost money. And gardener's salaries are not exorbitant, they're not very expensive. And so the other day I was at the Solaris building, which is this building in Singapore, and I asked the client, how many gardens do you have? And they said, just two. And so they can pay only for the salaries of two gardeners to maintain the vegetation in this building. So I called the garden index. Whenever I finish a building, uh, to the client, well, this is uh, a you know, two or three or four or one gardener index building. Um, what about the, the temperature? So I, you've mentioned some buildings that were in, in Singapore, uh, some in Malaysia. What about uh, in colder parts of the world? Would would the same principle apply, you think, or we would need to think completely differently about green architecture? Uh, in the temperate and cold climates, uh, green architecture lowers the ambient temperature near the facade by one to two degrees. Studies have been carried out in Germany where they show that by putting vegetation in the facades of the building, they can lower the ambient temperature in the facade, but only in the summer and as you hit towards the mid-season, hit towards spring or autumn, that works. But in the in the cold in the cold seasons, in winter time, and towards the end of the mid seasons, the vegetation acts as as, as a form of insulation between the outside and the inside, and so that enhances the thermal uh, uh, thermal performance. But it's not significant, and so uh, at lowering the temperature is more effective in the summertime in temperate climates and cold climates and in the tropics throughout the whole year. Okay, so we are going to wrap up this session soon, but first, again, I'd like to ask you if you have any highlight coming up in your work that you'd like to share with us. Well, uh, as you know, you know, we have offices in London, in Kuala Lumpur, and uh, eight offices in China. And so we're extremely busy right now. You know, uh, I'm working, you know, up to my eyebrows with work. And so um, every project for me is, is special. You know, it's like asking a, a mother, you know, which of your children do you love best? And a mother will usually say, I love all my children, but each one of them in a different way. So I love all my buildings in each one a different way. But with every project, we try and push the envelope a little bit. We've advanced the, the technology, both in terms of the premises underlying the architecture, both in terms of the system we use, and both in the micro details we use at the macro, meso, and the micro level. And so, uh, for instance, in the Solaris building, we have a diagonal light shaft. We have uh, operable louvers over the atrium. So we have many secondary devices in building that may not be immediately apparent to people who look at our buildings. And so that's the inventive aspects of our work. But invention and innovation is not just at the systems level, not the devices level, but also in, in, the, in the process. And so we're also innovating on a daily basis how we design, how we derive ideas, how we derive our building forms, how we interpret ecological systems. Uh, you know, ideas into our buildings. That beyond that, there is the premises that guide our architecture, that, that the theory and the, and the basic uh, principles. And so right now I'm working on a book on what I call eco-mimesis, which is the emulation and replication of ecosystem properties to make buildings into constructed or surrogate ecosystems. And so we're working, we know, we're working at several levels at the same time both at the macro, meso, and micro, at the theoretical, at the interpretation, at the technical, 
And so we have a very full life here. And so, you know, I hope we're able to accomplish all my agenda before I start pushing daisies, but that's, uh, that's, what, actually, <laughs> that's what makes my life exciting. That sounds exciting, Ken. And that's, uh, that means a lot of buildings that are already out there, a lot of buildings coming up, many books. I believe you, you have written already books. This is the one you're written at the mo writing at the moment. It's not the first one. Um, and I, I really look forward to see more and more of your work uh, out, out there and, and spread across, across the globe. Um, so, if, if there's anything, is there anything else you would like to add before we wrap up? Well, I'd like to quote from Kermit from Sesame Street, who sings the song, It's Not Easy Being Green. <laughs> All right. On this note, um, let's wrap up this session. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this session. I really enjoyed this session. And I look forward to the other session coming up for the diff today at the last day of the diff 2017 thank you very much for listening goodbye <laughs>